And uh, so I'm going to bring a word for you today. He was actually prepared to preach, and, and I just had a feeling late last night that maybe he wouldn't be available to do that. And so God just gave me a word that I really believe is a now word. But I do want to welcome our online family first. We're glad to have you with us today. If we can just give them a hand this morning. We appreciate you for sharing the service with us today and coming together in different places that we can just call on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we love you and we appreciate you and we pray that God will bless you today. And I just challenge you with get, get your family together this morning and just sit down and listen to the word that I know God has for us. And I want God to, to anoint the ears of those that are listening. Heavenly Father, please, that they will accept this word, God, and they will leave here if they were discouraged when they came in or when they sat down to watch this morning. Heavenly Father, they will leave here with a whole different attitude, God, and a whole different excitement, Lord Jesus, knowing that you were on the throne. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. We are very, I'm very sad not to have my honey with me because I love him very much. And we're just a team. We work together. Everything we do, we work together. And he has been very under the weather this week. And so I've done everything I know to do. I've, I've, I've oiled him down. I, those essential oils, man, I have covered him from head to toe. And I have diffused him in the house. And he's taken medicine. And, and I've snorted stuff up his nose as I can or whatever and done everything I could. And he is still under the weather and just didn't need to be around anybody today. But God is on the throne, and we're excited about that. And, and I just know that God has a plan. Actually, this evening at 6 o'clock, we have a plane that's leaving for Dallas from Charlotte, North Carolina. We're supposed to be in Dallas this week, and so we're going to cancel that trip. We know that God is in control, and I don't want him to go feeling bad. And so we're just excited that God has another plan. But anyway, I have a thing to say. I need you to hear something this morning. If you don't listen to anything else that I've said today and you don't remember anything else that I have to say today, I want you to hear this, and I want you to listen, and I want you to carry it with you every day. If you have to write it down, if you can't remember it, but it's pretty simple, I need you to hear that God is still in control. And he has not turned a deaf ear to you. The Bible says that if you were a child, what, what father, if a child asked for bread, would give them a stone? If he is your heavenly father, and he is my heavenly father, and he does hear me when I pray, I do have that confidence. He is not deaf to what I've said. And he is answering my prayer. And he loves it. He loves it. When I speak by faith, the Bible says we are not to walk, but we're not to walk by what we see. We're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. And that's what he's calling us to do right now. He is fully awake. He is fully aware and he has a plan. And so therefore, I'm going to ask you today a simple question. Why doubt? Have you found yourself in the last little bit doubting a little bit of what you thought was going to be? And it didn't turn out the way you thought. It could be a whole lot of situations in your life. Maybe not just in, in our nation but maybe in your personal life that things just have not turned out the way that you thought and you've prayed and you've, you've fasted and you've sought the Lord and, and you've walked with him and you know that he, he loves you and you know that he wants great things for you and you believe that you heard him in the still of the night, but yet things are not looking the way that they should look by now. 2020 has been a terrible year for everybody. It's been a year to remember. And God reminded me months ago, he said, you spoke a word in January that I gave you that I had great plans for your 2020, and I have not forgotten that. 2020 is not over yet. God still is on the throne. He's going to do great things, and we have to remember that. But I'm going to speak to you just for a few minutes today from a very familiar passage of Scripture, if you have your Bibles, if you'll get them out. And I sometimes feel like we depend on our iPads too much and our phones. And sometimes we just need that paper in front of us, right? But my vision is not quite as good as it used to be. So when I'm standing here, it's much easier for me to see this. But there's nothing like holding the Word of God in my hand and filling those pages and writing down notes. And I can go through and flip through those pages and I can see time and time again where I've written stuff down and prophecies that I've written in the back that have been fulfilled. And, and I can go and I can check them off and say, yes, God, you worked. Thank you, Lord, for answering that prayer request. Thank you, God, for this little note that I have here. But this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, and it's talking about Jesus and his disciples being on a boat. You've heard it. You can probably quote it, but we're going to go through it again this morning. Matthew 8, 23 through 27, it says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him, talking about Jesus. And suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. 
And the disciples went and, and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? In other words, why do you doubt? And then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed, and they asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Do you understand that the God that we serve or the God that we come to church every Sunday and on Wednesdays to to worship, do you understand that, that he can rebuke the wind and the waves? Do you not realize that the God that you come to worship every day and tell him how much you love him and tell him how much that you praise him and how you know that he is almighty and he can do anything, do you not realize that he holds the storm in his hand? I want to think about verse number 27. They questioned who Jesus was. Twelve men who followed him very closely questioned who he was. And if you go back to the beginning of chapter 8, and you don't have to do so, I'll do it in your your own prayer time, in your own study time, but if you go back to the beginning of chapter 8, you're going to find that the disciples had been with Jesus when he healed a man of leprosy, They'd been with Jesus when he healed the centurion's servant just with a word. They had been with Jesus when he healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever, and then she got up and fixed him something to eat. I'm waiting on Pastor Todd to get up and fix me something to eat. He cast out demons, and he healed. The Bible says that everybody at that time that came to him that was sick, he healed them. And the disciples had walked side by side. They had ate with him. They had prayed with him. They had, they had communed with him. They had slept in the same place. They had watched Jesus perform all of these miracles. They had a front row seat for all of these miracles. And you have to think, wow, at the end of that day, how fearless could your faith be, right? When you had watched him do all of that stuff, they had to be fearless with their faith. Verse number 18 actually says, as the crowd began to gather around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Now, how many of you know that when Jesus speaks or when God speaks, his word is true? It is yes and amen. When he says it, it's done, right? And so they forgot that quickly that Jesus said, let's get into the boat. We're going to go to the other side of the lake. Well, if they're going with Jesus and he said he was going to the other side of the lake, wouldn't you think they would realize that they're going to go as well? So if you're a Christian and you have Jesus in your heart and he says, I've got this, don't worry, would you not understand that he's got this, don't worry? That if he's going before you, everything's going to be okay? Do you not realize that? So I want to go back again. To verse number 23, I'm going to read that again. It says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. And suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? And then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed. And they asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. The disciples had walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They had watched him do all these things. And you would think that it would take more than a storm to make them afraid and make them doubt. They'd been in storms before. They were fishermen. They were on this boat. The Bible says that suddenly there was a storm. There was a suddenly storm, something they were not expecting. I happen to believe, and it's just me, it's not proven, but I happen to believe that when they got into the boat, everything was beautiful outside, or else they probably wouldn't have gone, right? Because they weren't on a carnival cruise liner. They were on a wooden boat that could be very dangerous, Listen, I was in a pontoon back in the summer. I'm not a boat person. 
And I would watch these people on these big bass boats like Craig rides and stuff, and I'm thinking, that water's just a little too close for me. I like being up here with a life jacket on. I want to stay where it's safe. So I really believe that it was a beautiful day when they got in that boat. And the Bible says, and suddenly there was a storm. It began to be tossed, and it began to be turned, and it began to be shaken. Do you think that maybe God's not trying to shake us a little bit right now? If COVID-19 had not shaken the church enough, do you not think that what's going on right now is going to give us a little more of a shaking? Do you think that he's trying to see who's really with me or who's going to panic when things don't seem to be going their way? When I don't answer as soon as they think I do or when they, I don't do things the way they say that I should? And I believe that they began to get afraid because I believe they were close to capsizing. It says that the, the, water, the water was raging over them. I believe the boat was taking on water. And I think that maybe they were surprised when they turned around and realized that, that, that maybe G, Jesus is with them, but they're still afraid. But Jesus is asleep. How can he sleep? Does he not know they're afraid? Does he not care? Is Jesus not concerned about you, Rosie? Does Jesus not love you enough, Tracy, that you think he's sleeping? He's not asleep. He's not afraid. How could you sleep at a time like this, Jesus? And what did Jesus do? And I love this because he didn't get up and speak to the storm first. He spoke to their unbelief. He didn't calm that storm. Not immediately. And you know what? We don't even know how long it was. That's the crazy thing about the Bible. It doesn't tell you how long it took in some of these stories. Let's just, just if you'll just humor me for a minute, maybe it took an hour. Maybe he stood up and he said, oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Why do you doubt? And maybe he just stood there. Maybe he took another nap. That sounds far-fetched. I'm not trying to add or take away to the Bible. I'm just saying it doesn't tell us. So what if he did? And then he rebuked the storm. I think it's kind of funny how he did that. And so it's really, I've, I've been thinking here lately over the last few days of how easy it is for us to sit and judge people in the Bible. Because you're thinking they were with, they walked with God. Like Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the cool of the day. How could they be tempted and fall apart? You know, of course, Daniel, when he went into the lion's den, of course he was brave. Throw me in that lion's den. I'm okay with that. I don't think he felt that way. I think he was terrified. I think he was scared to death. You know why? Because he's a human and he has human thoughts. And if you tell a human, love Jesus or not, serve God or not, that you're going to throw them in the pit of hungry lions, that would cause a little bit of anxiety, I would think. I don't think he went in with no fear, but I do think he went in with a whole lot of faith. And I think that his whole thought was, God, you're going to deliver me from these lions, but if you don't, you're still God. You're still the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I'm still going to praise you, and I'm still going to worship you, and I'm still going to proclaim who you are to everybody that I meet. And sometimes it's easy to sit back and say, man, those 12 disciples, like they walked with Jesus. They talked with him. Like he, he talked to them one-on-one. -on -one. How could they doubt who he was? How could they betray him? How could they be afraid in a storm? It's a storm. This is Jesus. I wouldn't have done that if I was a disciple. Really? Let's think about that for just a minute. You know, I, I would like to say that when we get saved and we accept Jesus in our heart and we declare God as King of kings and Lord of lords, I would love to say that life is perfect. I would love to say that you never have trouble and struggles and, and situations that come your way that take you completely off guard. 
I would love to say that everybody's going to love you and, and, and talk great about you and never stab you in the back or, or, or do ugly things to you. I would love to say that, but that's not true. Sometimes we even have storms that come in our lives. I mean, you know, we, we preach about it and we sing about he's a, prom- he's a miracle worker, way maker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness. When he speaks, storms have to cease. When he speaks, everybody knows it's him. We shout it from the mountaintop when things are going great. All those things are true, by the way. But we shout it when things are going great. But when things aren't going great, what do we do? When God doesn't stop the storm or calm the storm, but yet right now he's saying, Oh, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Why are you doubting me? And then he goes like this. Are you there? Do you hear me, Lord? Are you working? Is he asleep? This was a scripture that gave me complete peace when I used to live by myself. 1,500 miles away from home. And I would lay my head down at night. Psalm 121 and 1. It says, my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. And I'm going to read the version that we have up here. I actually had a different version that I gave them. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? He who watches over Israel will neither neither slumber nor sleep. He's not asleep. That should give us comfort. The Bible also says that he hears the prayers of the righteous. Psalm 34, 17 says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them and he delivers them from all their troubles. Is there any righteous people in here today? Not perfect but striving to be holy, seeking God with all you have, trying your best to serve him the best way that you can. Are you here? Raise your hand if you're here. God, I am a righteous servant, and I'm crying out, and you say that if I cry out to you that you hear me, and not only do you hear me, but you will deliver me. God, I cry out on behalf of this nation. Lord, you are hearing the prayers of righteous people. And you're working even when we can't see it. You hear us, Lord. I take comfort in that. No matter what you happen to be facing at this moment, no matter what the nation is going through, I am here to remind you what Jesus said to the disciples. You of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Why are you letting anxiety rule you? That is a demon from the pits of hell that will kill you if you let it. That is a spirit that is not of God. God gives us power over that stuff that we can stomp on it, put it under your feet, call it by name. You may think I'm crazy, and I don't care. And I always tell Pastor Todd, don't say that. That's so rude. Say it doesn't matter. I don't care. 
I don't care if you think I'm crazy about Jesus. I don't care if you think that I'm a little bit radical about how I pray. Pastor Todd was taking a nap yesterday, and I was, you know, we had this, we had this trip coming up, and, you know, it was, it was an invitation. It was a kind of a special thing, and so he was worried about, and it was, it was ministry. It was a great opportunity, and I know he was worried about me and what I thought, and, and I was worried about him being sick, and Butch and Janice were going with us as well, and so I was thinking about them, and so Pastor Todd had, you know, he went out and fed the donkey and did a few things, and and um, just came in and was exhausted, and he laid down to take a nap. And so when he went to sleep, and I knew he was good and asleep, I went outside. And when I went outside, I thought, oh, no, I'm not just coming outside. I went back in the house, and I got me a bottle of vegetable oil. And I walked out in our yard, and I poured that bottle all around it. And I prayed over it, and I anointed that ground. And I said, devil, you have no authority over my husband in Jesus' name. You can't control him with sickness in the name of Jesus. We don't have to take that trip. I'm okay with that. But he's going to be healed in Jesus' name. He's going to be delivered in Jesus' name. And when I poured, I walked seven times around that place, maybe eight. I might have lost count. And after I got finished, I put on some music, and I put on that song, Hell or High Water. And I walked up and down my driveway. And if you don't know where we live, it's okay, but we live up on a hill, and we do have neighbors. And as I was singing it, and it come to that part, come hell or high water, I began to praise. And I walked up and down that driveway praising the Lord. And I didn't care who saw me. And I didn't care what they thought. God has not fallen asleep. Could it be that in the middle of the silence that God is working? Could it be that he has a plan that's bigger than we can understand? Lord, I sure hope so, right? Could it be that he is tired of man getting credit? Maybe he's tired of evil. Maybe he's in the the business of exposing what's in the dark and bringing it to light. And I can tell you with everything that's inside of me, and I won't back down. God is exposing He is exposing the darkness. Let him work. Let him do. You don't have time to doubt. You don't have time to be afraid. You need to be praying with prayers that are are sharp, with prayers that are powerful. You know I say I'm God's favorite. I say it all the time. And it's a joke if you've ever been, if you're new, don't think I'm being hyper-spiritual. You know why I say that I'm his favorite? Because it helps me. It lets me know that when I get in my throne room praying to the Lord in his presence, I know he hears me. I know I'm important. I know that no matter how big or how small my situation is, God cares. That's why I say I'm his favorite, and you should say the same. Of course the Bible says he doesn't have favorites, but I'm his favorite. Do you think that maybe he's trying to stretch your faith just a little bit? We will never grow in the Lord if we don't face opposition. We will never grow in him. Opposition comes in many ways. It comes in sickness. It comes in sometimes when people pass away. It comes in relationships not working. It comes in relationships breaking up. It comes in marriages breaking up. We don't have to fall apart at the drop of a hat. God needs to know that his people know that he's in control. And your doubt will not show him that. Your lack of faith won't show him that. He has to know that you know. 
There's going to be a great awakening that I know is coming. I believe it's biblical. And I have heard the words, and you, some of you have heard it. Most of you have, if you've been here long. I have heard the words in my spirit, signs and wonders, for years. Probably three years, maybe two. Signs and wonders, signs and wonders, signs and wonders. We've not seen that yet. Sure, people get healed. Sure, people get delivered and set free, and, and people get saved. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the dead being raised. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit drawing people from the north, the south, the east, and the west because they're hungry for God. Sometimes when we get desperate, we go searching for God. And if you don't think there's not people out there desperate right now and worried and concerned, you got you thinking wrong. Because I know if God's people, his church people, his people that, that follow him, that love him, that know what he can do, I know if they're afraid, what can you imagine for people that really don't have a relationship with him? Can you imagine? So you don't have time for that. There's no excuse for it. If you're facing anxiety, you know what I'm going to tell you? You got to make it happen and get over it. I'm not saying it's not real. I get it. I know it's real. I've seen it firsthand. I know it's a spirit. But you have to give in to that spirit. You've got to stop giving in to it. Take every thought captive that comes to your mind. I have not watched a news program since this stuff even happened. I refuse. If they're not speaking God's word, I'm not listening. Why? Because I can't. I can't fill my mind with it. Because behind the scenes, that is fear that's taunting God's people. It's like a, a, a nipping dog at your heels constantly. See, told you. See, God's not working. See, they're going to shut your church down. See, they're, going, they're, they're not going to let you do this anymore. See, I don't listen to it. I can't be full of fear and full of faith at the same time. I can't have faith to keep my, my one foot going in front of another if I sit and watch that and fill my mind with it because it is not true. If you don't think that the enemy is not using the media to destroy our country, you've lost it because they have. That's what he's doing. Stay off of social media if it causes you anxiety. Don't read that junk. You get in the Word. If we would read the Word and listen to the Word as much as we watch the news or listen to people chatter, that great awakening would already be here. God is not finished with the church yet. So what about you? What about you? Where are you at? What have you allowed the enemy to tell you that's causing you to doubt your faith or, or to doubt what God can do or to doubt that God is listening to you or to doubt that God is working or to doubt that God is moving? You know that song that says waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness? It also says, even when I can't see it, you're working. He don't have to get my permission to work. He can do it all by himself. So I have two choices. I have watched him heal. I have watched him set people free. I have watched him save people. I have watched people laying on a deathbed and him bring them back to health. I have watched that. So why doubt because of, suddenly, of a suddenly storm? Do you think the enemy is going to let go that easy? We live in a spiritual battle. 
Things go on in the supernatural world that we don't even know. And if God took the blinders off of our eyes where we could see it, it would scare most people half to death. You won't win this battle fighting in your mind. You will win this battle fighting on your knees. And when you begin to doubt and when you begin to worry and when you begin to think God is not there, you need to remember that He's speaking to your faith first. Jesus, don't you care that we're drowning? God, do you not hear me? Because you say that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven and you will heal our land. Did you not hear us pray that, God? Oh, you of little faith. Maybe, just maybe, he's raising you up for a bigger purpose. And when I was praying this morning, something else came to my mind. And when I talk about the great awakening and when I talk about, um, you know, signs and wonders, it was like God said, if I can't trust my people, if they can't believe and have faith to know that I'm here during this time, then they're not going to have the faith to believe for signs and wonders. So back before we, um, before years ago, we were in at the church on 24th Street. And we were growing, and we knew we needed a building. And we, we were talking about building on the property that we had there on 24th Street, and we ended up not having room, but that's a different story. But God put in my spirit that we would not have to pay for that building, that we would not have to go into debt for a new building. And he took me back. To years before, when Pastor Todd and I were going through the hardest financial time we ever had in our whole marriage. And honestly, it was really not anything we really did. It was real estate, and the bottom dropped out, and we lost a lot of that stuff, assets. And I can remember we um, laying in my living room floor, literally, one night, with the blinds closed, but I can remember that the, the moon was shining through, and I could see. And I remember calling out to God, God, I don't understand. Like, I don't get it. We pay our tithes. We're faithful. Like, I don't get it. I don't know what's going on. And if you don't do something, I don't know what I'm going to do. And the Lord said, if you can't trust me with a light bill, then how are you going to trust me for a million-dollar building one day? We didn't have this ministry yet. We weren't at Life Changers. So every time, and the, the council will tell you, and Pastor Todd will tell you, that we would sit down and start putting numbers together for a million-dollar building because we, no, we, we had to do something. And... I would say, you know, these numbers are great and all, but I don't believe we're going to have to use a bank. I had no reason to think that. Except the word that God gave me in the middle of the night. So why doubt? Everybody will just stand. With everybody's eyes closed and nobody looking around and give you some private time. The thing that gives me comfort, one of the greatest things that gives me comfort in this story, is when Jesus said, let's go to the other side, or I'm going to the other side. And because the disciples were following him, that should have automatically been a sign that he was going to take care of them because they were his and they were in his boat. 
And you may be here this morning and you say, I'm not even saved. Well, can I tell you? Then you're not in his boat. I hate to sound rude and I hate to sound crude, but if you're not in his boat, then these promises aren't for you. These promises are for his children. And if you're not his child, then these promises are not for you. But there's hope because you can ask him into your life and you can get in his boat today. And if you're that person this morning that says, you know, I, I'm not even saved. Like I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Nobody's looking but me and Jesus. Would you raise your hand? And if you can honestly say that, that, that you're not saved, then I encourage you, if, if, if you're wanting this, I mean, God knows your heart. He knows if you mean it or not. And you just say, God, come into my life. Forgive me for my sins. Change me, Lord. Come and live inside of me. I want to follow you. I believe that you died on the cross and your blood was shed for my sins. And I accept you as my Savior today. And if you do that and you mean it, then you stay in church and you get in the Bible and you begin to read. If you don't understand it, you, you check in with, with us. We'll make sure you get plugged in. And you may be here this morning and you say, you know what? I'm fearful and I will admit it. Don't be, don't be ashamed to do that. The enemy hates it when we acknowledge those things. And we have people praying for us. If you're somebody in here this morning and you can say, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm doubting. I want you to raise your hand. Things haven't happened the way I wanted them to. And I'm a little concerned. My life is not going the way I thought it would at this point. And I'm a little concerned. Raise your hand if that's you. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everywhere. Everywhere. Well, I'm here today to tell you that Jesus is not asleep. He's not asleep. And he loves you. Heavenly Father, I just love you. I lift you up, Lord Jesus. And I pray for those, Lord God, that ask you in their heart, Lord Jesus, that you would show them something really great. Lord God, show yourself strong in a mighty way in their life so they can see that you are God and you are who you say you are and you heard their prayer. And I rebuke the spirit of fear and I rebuke the spirit of doubt that is trying to hover over your people today in Jesus' name. Whether they're in this building or whether they're watching online, God, I, I command that spirit from hell to leave right now in the name of Jesus and go straight back to hell where it came from in the name of Jesus. God, we call peace down from heaven. A peace that surpasses all understanding that even when we can't see it, we know you're there. We know you've heard us, God, and we know you're working and we're going to stand on that. And we're not going to be double-minded and, and be worried today and faithful tomorrow. We're going to stand on this word. And believe you are who you say you are. Our faith will get stronger during this time. We will not let anxiety overtake us in Jesus' name. God, we love you and we praise you. And we give you glory, God, for everything that you have done. Man will never take the credit for your greatness. And Lord Jesus, one day every knee will bow... And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But God, we want to proclaim it now. You are Lord. You are holy. And you hear the cries of your people. If you care enough to keep our tears in a bottle, the word says then you obviously care about what's going on today. We give you praise for all things. 
we call it done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody give God a hand clap of praise. As we close this morning, if you'll get out your tithes and offerings, that would be great. Get those prepared to give as you leave. As you exit the building, our ushers will be waiting on you in the wings. Thank you for giving. God is not finished with the church yet. And it is because of your giving and you being faithful that we didn't have to go into a million dollar debt. Actually, it was two million, two and a half million dollar debt. For those that are new here or you don't know the story, I won't bore you with it. It's actually pretty exciting. But I won't take the time for that this morning. We were getting ready to build on Cove Road. We had all of our engineering stuff working and going. We paid for everything as we went. We did not have $2 million in the bank. But we knew God was faithful. We got a call from our bishop who asked us if we would like this building and 17 acres of land for free. Tell me God don't work. And you know how many years it was? From the time God told me, if I couldn't trust him with a light bill, I would never be able to trust him for a million dollar building. Do you know how many years it was? I don't even know. But it wasn't suddenly. I had to walk it out. but it's because of your giving that we've got to do all that we've done in this building. It's just a building. Yes, it is just a building. But you know what? God dwells here, and it's special, and we love it. As you get out your tithes and offerings and prepare to leave, thank you so much for giving. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. God, we just come to you, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for every penny that goes into this offering plate. Heavenly Father, you have never let us down before, and you're not going to let us down now. If there's ever been a time for the church to be excited, it's now. It's today. We're on the verge of seeing a miracle that only you can perform. And you will bring the evil to their knees in the name of Jesus. And you will expose the darkness for what it is. And we won't gloat. And we won't laugh. We won't scoff, Lord God, because it's very sad. But we will praise you and we will worship you when it happens. Until that time, we'll praise you and we'll worship you anyway, knowing that it's going to. Thank you for the offering that's coming in. God bless the gift as well as the giver. We give you praise for all things and we count it done in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. If our